with an agency, right? We have with the chamber is here. Anybody else with a business? Businesses. And you're with? Workforce safety. Okay. Yeah. There you go. So there's where some of those fears come in. <laughs> <laughs> so, but real quick, how that? Because I feel like my whole life kind of led up to this calling. So. Um, my mom was one of the first teachers in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as kids were coming out in the late 50s of institutions. Because if you know back then, if you had a child that was severely disabled, they were taken away and put in an institution. So my mom was one of the first teachers as they were coming out in institutions to integrate them into a regular school. She still had a classroom, but it was in just a regular school. And back then, kids were even like what they called banana carts. They were these flat bed boards that they were wheeled around on. And uh, mom's class was, she had taught learning disabilities, but at this point she went into more severe disabilities. So I was around kids like this my whole life. And uh, I had a great mom, because she said everybody's here for a purpose. Whether it's to train us on uh, patients or and you know, you're giving people, they're giving people jobs by take, you take care of them. And we all need different things. You know, I can't change my own oil and uh, Cleo will tell you I'm really bad with, if you see the wires, it's time to change the tires. So <laughs> we all need people that help us. But and she really, that was, her, she really understood that to a point way beyond. And I always think having those kids all day long and then coming home with my brother and I, and my parents were 40 before they had my brother and I, so they were older parents, uh, which was really unusual back then. And then my dad had been a lineman. He'd been in World War II, and then he became a lineman. Um, he had eighth grade education back then. You did what you needed to do, right? So he became an electrician and um, put the lines up across America with L.A. Myers and met my mom in Ohio, and they moved to Milwaukee. And he was up on a scaffolding. It was 1965. And back then, they didn't have all the safety equipment. Fell five stories, but did a somersault. And um, but he, of course, had a lot of damage to his leg and uh, was in traction. Back then, they kept you in traction. They didn't let you go home, and they didn't let kids up to the hospital either. And I was the daddy's girl. Anybody else the daddy's girl? So it was as a little girl. I don't think I completely understood what was happening. Um, but he. Uh, got out of the hospital and uh, then had a pulmonary embolism because of blood clot. They didn't have you moving like they do now. So at five years old, I knew what a pulmonary embolism was. And then he ended up having one of the first open heart surgeries at Mayo Clinic. When they cut you around like this, he's actually in the books. So he had like a quadruple bypass. And uh, they realized he had had some uh, valve issues from um, rheumatic fever. In which they realized now a lot of that age group did have a valve issues from rheumatic fever. So my dad couldn't be, be an electrician anymore. He became a travel agent. No questions asked. It wasn't, oh, poor me. What am I going to do? It was, what am I really good at? And I got my gift again. He was Norwegian. We talk about uh, jokes. Uh, you know, God made Norwegians first. He wanted to start with something real simple. So, but that was, so I had great parents. And, um, I was very lucky, so that I think led a lot to what my attitude was as I went through life. Uh, unfortunately, when I was 19, my dad passed away. Uh, he had a massive heart attack at the breakfast table, and uh, I was pretty devastated, pretty lost when you're that age. Um, well, I should mention to you before that, we lived in Milwaukee. So when I was, dad was getting sicker, his family was from Scotland, South Dakota, population 500. So they decided mom would go teach there. So we moved from Milwaukee, Wisconsin to Scotland, South Dakota. 15 years old. I got another therapy last week. So yeah, it was, it was a culture shock. It was completely different. It's not like now, you know, everything's kind of connected. You know, you're not far from Fargo. Everybody inter intermixes, interchanges. You travel up there, people come down. But then in 1975, the little, you, you, when you were in the little town, you did not, if you went to Sioux Falls, it was like a huge outing, it was maybe once a year. Uh, and I had more kids in my class than there were in the whole town of Scotland. And of course, I, when you're in the city, you, you know, I wore my little dresses and 
all the girls there were in their, in their cowboy boots and they got knotted chores and came to school. So it was, it was a little bit of an adjustment, to say the least, but um, I have the gift of gab, so I made a lot of friends. Uh, not real quickly, it took me about a year, but um, they were, it was a close community, which was good, and they had some aunts there. And, uh, when my dad passed away, I was very thankful because there were so many people that supported me. But I got a little lost at that time, and I ended up, that's when I ended up in that bad marriage. I, we dated for quite a few years, and that's the thing, though, and I think we talk to young girls now, but back then we didn't talk about it at all. He was very charming, you know, and a lot of these things didn't come out until after we married. Although, if you should look at us, family, we realize now that that those type of behaviors went on. And I, I uh, don't know that he's ever been diagnosed, but I believe he was probably bipolar as well, which I had no idea that when my husband was telling me something. Closer? Away? What? I'm not, excuse me, but I'm not so sure that mic is working real good. Can everybody hear real uh, good? Yeah. Okay, all right. I just um, wanted to make sure. Thank you. He's my manager. <laughs> <laughs> Although we resigned today. Just checking. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> those are things we just didn't talk about. So how, you know, we, we just go back a generation. It's just me. I always say, and how different things were. So, I, uh, it's 1982. I, um have this happen where I'm in the field and I am in the hospital and they are going to release me back to him. They did it. And the police, if you ask the police, they're like, well, what did you do to make him so angry? I was sound asleep in bed. He came home and tried me out of bed. And there was, you know, and at the time, though, that's the thing, you know, when you're going through it, you think, what did I do wrong? Especially coming from this good Norwegian family where if my dad said, bull, my mother would be, oh, no, 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 no. Stop that. So, I mean, it was just, you know, we didn't have anything like this. I call it beaver cleaver syndrome. Because when I would go to a counselor, they'd say, oh, well, your family. I'm like, no, I didn't know people like this even exist at all. There was no talk about that back then. And I think in a lot of the farming communities, it was really headed even more than if you lived in a major city. So they were going to release me back to him. The police would just, there wasn't really police reports. There wasn't a way to really do child support at all. So I left, I was living in Spearfish at that time. He'd gotten a job in the gold mine and I left in the middle of the night with my two-year-old daughter, Jackie, and we went to Denver. I didn't know a soul, I didn't have a job. I had to take gas and I had about $400 that I saved. I think about it now and I think, oh my goodness, my poor mother. <laughs> must have been worried to death because now if my girls don't answer their cell phone immediately I'm like oh my god something's happened and Jack is like mom I'm probably taking a nap because I am more out for my kids I'm like oh we need to answer your phone but there was no cell phones no GPS I mean and I tell my grandkids this and I was like so was it covered wagons grandma no, it was not that far back but I, you know it was just such a different place in time but the good part of that is People were a lot more trusting, a lot more open. So people opened themselves to me. I made one of my best friends uh, at that time, and she was about 14 years older, and um, she was just a blessing. And then I had another family that had five kids. So I go to school during the day, and at night she was a cook for a gourmet family, and he was in law school. So I watched their five kids, and we just trade back and forth. So I ended up going to Mar um, broadcasting school in Denver. And that back then, here's another thing that's changed so much. You had to have an engineering license, class one, to be on the air. So that's why there was very few women in broadcasting, because women were afraid to go take that test or go do that. And if you were on a more than 1,500 watt station, you had to have the class one to be on, in the station by yourself. So when I graduated, I, I, I did, I passed that test. And I think I didn't realize I was that smart even because I had some dyslexia growing up. Not, uh, not severe, but enough like I would stumble if I read out loud. So I would always figure out what paragraph was going to be mine in class and I would memorize by the time they got to me. So I, I did have some trouble. My brother has severe dyslexia, but he's gone on to be a manager of Fortune 500 companies. And he has this memory that is crazy. 
In fact, we always kid him, like, don't Google it, call Phil. And he's in, uh, he's in uh, Sioux Falls. So, uh, you know, again, it's like all about ability. So for things that you have some difficulty in, you, you're, you're a problem solver and you figure it out. Um, so I came back and my first job was in Sturgis, South Dakota. And I didn't know anything about the bike rally. I didn't even realize it was a bike rally. And the, the station was out in the field, and I called the original WKRP. So I was the only girl on the loading docks, literally. And uh, we had crazy, crazy things happen at the station. One time we had a guy who was a crop duster, and he was one of our sales guys. And he took colored paper plates and uh, flew over the town of Sturgis. And on the plates, it would say 25% off at Sturgis Drug, 30% off at Ingalls Department Store. And you got the plate, you could take it in. Well, the phone's ringing, I answer it. And it is um, the F C no the F the F A yeah telling us that we were flying too close to population littering uh, there was a whole lot of things we had done wrong and uh, somehow it was my fault I am not sure how that happened I can tell you some other stories but uh, they're probably ones that would go over better drinking but it was uh, yeah it was a different place at times so you know I would get the guys with tease me, harass me, and he, I, you know, he, that was the time, you didn't think much of it, but I had a guy that stalked me, literally stalking me, like following me home, or I would get on the station, it was all, I mean, in the middle of the field is where the Sturgis station was, I would literally have cow prints on the windows of my car, because they were out in that field, and this, you know, and this guy was stalking me, and I finally, I told the manager, or the owner, less than I got fired, because if I wasn't there, it wouldn't be happening. So I was like, okay, I've got a two-year-old, we gotta keep going here. And um, I ended up in television and rapid, and I did meteorology, and I worked at another uh, radio station, and um, they asked me to come back. And I'm Norwegian, so I'm like, okay, <laughs> I went back. I got a, a raise, and I should've known better, but I went back, and uh, um, which was another kind of amazing thing, though I got to, they were a country western station, so Les, he would call me Little One. He was on the air, he's like, Little One, come in here. And I'm like, what? He goes, you know who this John K guy is? I'm like, what, what did I do? I thought I insulted somebody or done something wrong on here. He's like, no, you're a Steppenwolf, and they want to have a concert out here, and we're a country format, so you're in charge. So I got to do the first live concert in Sturgis, South Dakota in 1987. Um, and when we have a picture aerial, there's about 10 outhouses and probably 400 people. <laughs> and now you look at it as like, holy smokes. But it was back when it was, you know, kind of, it was a cheap, fun vacation for people to come out on their bikes. Um, and again, I was there about a year and a half, and um, I had another incident with a guy, and um, I reported it, and I got fired again. <laughs> So, but I am Norwegian, so I didn't do it three times. Um, so I was, I was pretty devastated. So I'm like, I have a two-year-old. I will now. Jackie is like five. She's gonna start school. I, you know, I didn't have any child support. So I thought, well, you know what? I like clothes. I could go do retail. So I went in and I applied for a job. I went, had gone through job service, and went in and applied for the job to be a retail clerk. And I interviewed, and they called me back, and they said. We want to hire you, but not as a retail clerk. We want to hire you as our marketing director. Now, this is kind of like a working woman. Uh, if you ever saw that movie, Epiphany. I am now in charge of a million dollar account, and that radio station has to come to me. To get me. <laughs> and you know, I think it was like 20 years before I realized how cool was that? that happened. I didn't even realize. So that kind of led me through my uh, career and then I ended up down in Denver doing all the marketing for the casinos and um, they said to me, can you do bus groups? I'm like, I've been on a school bus. Does that count? <laughs> so, and I did say sure. And I think that's one thing, you know, as you work with people too, and always encourage them if there's an opportunity to not say no. I mean, I, I, I was scared. I thought, oh, how is this going to work? And I think, but when you think about it, the worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work out and you go back to what you were doing before. But it did work out, and I ended up having a huge tour company in Denver, uh, the biggest receptive, which was groups coming in, and um, then we did outgoing groups to all kinds of places and a lot of senior groups. 
Um, and then my mom came to visit, and it was just going to be for a short time. Uh, my husband at that time took a position in Memphis, and I had the two girls, and my girls were 10 years apart. I say it's because I forgot what caused it. Um, so I had the house of hormones, and one was a cry, and the other one was a teenager and a four-year-old. And mom came out to help me for just going to be two weeks. Um, long story short, she ended up with a little bit of stomach brain tumor, which is a brain tumor that doubles its size every 10 days. Uh, I'm thankful she was in Denver.